second installment of the legal um, uh, presentation that I am doing. My name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I'm in Martha's Vineyard, so I don't have my official looking suit on. Uh, but I'm an attorney at Marrick O'Connell, which is a fairly large firm in uh, Worcester. There are 63 of us. Uh, what I do, what's nice about having 63 lawyers is that there's somebody there that really knows a lot about just about everything, and I'm the one that does uh, elder law. Uh, I've been coming here, though, for several years because my paralegal, uh, who's been with me for uh, ever, uh, is named Brenda Costa, and she grew up here on Martha's Vineyard. She's right there. Um, so I always tell people this is kind of a ventriloquist act. I talk, but she's the brains of the operation. So if you have really complicated questions, always ask Brenda. Um, when I moved to Marek O'Connell, that was the one rule that I said that I had to have Brenda come with me. So we've, we've stayed together. Um, we're talking today about uh, a topic which it is the one elder law topic that really affects everybody. Um, everybody ought to be dealing with these two issues, um, with the way that you kind of keep control of your life, but it especially affects, affects elders, and that's why it's, it's important. First slide. Um, the, two, the, the issue is, if, if, suppose you get into an accident, or suppose you have a stroke. Right? So about any number of things. There are three possibilities if something really bad happens to you. You can get better, or you can die, or you can get kind of stuck in the middle someplace where things aren't great and you really don't have the ability to make decisions that you would normally be making for yourself. That can also happen to you as you get older and if you get frail and, and, and it, can, it can happen at any time, but the point is it can happen to anybody. And if you find yourself in that situation, or if your family finds you in that situation, uh, and you haven't ahead of time dealt with who is going to be making some basic decisions for you, then there is only one alternative, uh, and that is guardianship. Uh, that is, someone has to go to court, um, file a petition, get a doctor's certificate, uh, um, go in and basically get a doctor's certificate that says that you are mentally ill or incapacitated and go through this very public process, often with ads in the paper, to determine that somebody can make a medical or an individual or a legal decision for you. So, one of the problems, the problem with having to go through that process, as I say, everybody thinks you're crazy. A lot of times there are these kind of, very, it's very public, it's a very public process. Um, you need this doctor's certificate, you need to have publication. The other piece of it is, it takes forever. I, w I recently had this situation where some folks came in, some of the kids came in, because they were trying to deal with um, their folks' situation. Their mother had died, their father had had a stroke. What do, what do we do? Well, and he didn't have any documents, and I had to break the news to them that, in, that certainly one of them would be able to become the guardian, but it was going to take two weeks probably to get a temporary uncontested guardianship. It was, going to, it was going to take two months to get a contested permanent guardianship. And it was probably going to cost in the neighborhood of like $5,000 to go through this process because it involves not only doing a ton of paperwork, but having to go to court. And going to court is the expensive part of any of these, any of these processes because you never know how long it's going to take. Next slide. So you want to avoid it because as a result of having all those lawyers spending all that time going to court, uh, it costs a tremendous amount of money um, because lawyers are just sitting there waiting. Now I know it's, it is much more reasonable if you happen to be lucky and you live here full time and you're in Dukes County because you have your own special little court that has your own probate court in it and there aren't a lot of people in Dukes County. There are only about 20,000 of you, I am told, that are here full time and therefore things go quicker. Uh, when I go to Middlesex County, 
um, in Cambridge, which includes a quarter of the population of the state, uh, when I go for one of these little hearings, typically the hearing involving any of these issues, these are for uncontested issues, the hearing only takes about five minutes. But I'll always tell my clients, so the question in terms of your bill is going to be, which five minutes is it going to be? Is it going to be the five minutes at 8.30 when the court opens, or the five minutes at 4 o'clock at the end of the day? Because at the beginning of the session, there are 100 people waiting to be heard, and the court decides who hears what first. So it's an expensive process. Um, once you've been appointed as the guardian, there are bond costs. You actually have, if, 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 you're, if uh, one of your children gets appointed as your guardian and you have assets of worth more than $100,000, which is pretty much everybody, that means that the child has to actually get an insurance company bond in order to guarantee that the child isn't going to steal the money. And that bond cost is several thousand dollars a year. There are annual reporting requirements for the rest of your life. Right? If the, there's a guardian, every year there has to be another report that gets done. That means you have to hire the lawyer again. Every time a report gets done, there's a GAL that gets appointed, and that's a guardian ad litem, a guardian for your benefit to make sure that the guardian isn't stealing the money. Um, but that person has to get, get paid. It's just very cumbersome. And finally, it brings out the worst in people. The most awful cases in court that I've ever been involved in have been guardian cases typically involving uh, children fighting over who was going to be Ma's guardian or who was going to be Aunt so-and-so's guardian. Uh, it just, if you haven't resolved the issue for them by actually naming somebody ahead of time, th those fights can just go forever. So there are a lot of reasons why you don't want to go through that process. Next slide. So there are two kinds of documents that can keep you from ever having to go through that process. They cost practically nothing. They're easy to do. The first one is a power of attorney and the second one is a health care proxy. What is the difference? A power of attorney, through a power of attorney, you name somebody, it's called your attorney in fact, uh, or your agent, to make any legal decision that you otherwise had the power to make. Now you can also write a limited power of attorney. For example, my wife and I are selling our house and it's closing today but we really didn't want to be there. So we gave somebody a limited power of attorney, appointing them to be our agent for just today and for just that matter. What I'm really talking about here, though, are general powers of attorney. So you need a power of attorney. Once you've done that, the person that you've named has the ability to make every decision that you could otherwise make regarding every matter except a medical one, except a decision regarding your health, and for that, you need a health care proxy. So we're going to talk about just those two things, powers of attorney and health care proxies. Now, one of the issues with a power of attorney with that folks are regularly bring up, especially if they don't need one, I mean, it's a power of attorney is a classic in that you typically are signing it before you need it, is people are concerned to be giving that kind of power to somebody because the person who was the holder of this general power of attorney really does have the capacity to do everything you can do, like sign your deed, uh, or go to your bank and take out all the money, or call the, the, the uh, brokerage house and move your stocks around. <laughs> he can really do all the things that you can do. So many people are concerned about that uh, and want to make sure that that kind of document isn't kind of out there unless it has to be. One way of doing that is to do something called a springing power of attorney. You can write a power of attorney um, in which you specify that it only comes into existence once something has happened, once your doctor has done a medical certificate that says, that certifies that you're incapable of making legal decisions, or, whether some, or once somebody else has done that, one of your children or somebody else. Um, the only problem with springing powers of attorney is that they can, can create confusion for the person that you're act, actually asking or giving the power of attorney say, and, to and saying, well, I want something done now. If I'm the bank, for example, and, and your child comes into me with a springing power of attorney and says, well, I really want to um, cash um, uh, this, or I want to sign this check on behalf of my mother or my father, and the, the banker is supposed to look at this to make sure that this person is really authorized. Now, if he sees this section in the power of attorney that says, well, it only takes effect when such and such a thing happens, like when there is a doctor's certificate that says that you are incapable of handling, of handling your legal affairs, or when somebody else has to sign off, 
Now that banker has to go look at the power of attorney and see if that extra document is attached and make sure that it matches up to the power of attorney. So there can be some confusion about springing powers of attorney, but that's one way that you can handle it. Um, a more common way um, is to basically, if you've, you're concerned about this issue, to have somebody hold the power of attorney in escrow. I know when we're drafting them, a lot of times that's what we end up doing. Uh, we end up holding the power of attorney um, with instructions from the client, with written instructions from the client that would say, you're not to release this power of attorney to my son or my daughter unless you get a medical certificate or something that convinces you that I am no longer capable of handling my own affairs. So you have the advantage of knowing there's a power of attorney that's there if you need it, but you know it's not like out there if you don't want it. So that's kind of another possibility. Um, powers of attorney, what, you know, I just want to just talk about what powers of attorney are. Um, most people will take a copy of a power of attorney uh, as opposed to the original. Uh, oftentimes you'll put that language right in the power of attorney that says that a, a copy is as good as an original uh, because you don't want to be having to do like 10 of these, you know. The only exception to that rule um, is that is if, 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 as far as real estate is concerned, if someone is signing a deed on your behalf, um, then in addition to the deed being recorded, the original power of attorney has to be recorded. And if that's the case, um, the power of attorney also has to have been notarized. In general, a power of attorney does not have to be notarized. Uh, it doesn't even, um, it, it, has to be, it has to be witnessed, but not, doesn't have to be notarized. Um, and the power of attorney must be durable. Well, it doesn't have to be durable. Um, but what is durable? Bef before about the mid-1990s, um, the law was that a power of attorney, uh, once you became incapacitated, automatically was no good. And the reason was because it, you always are supposed to have the right to revoke a power of attorney, and once you became incapacitated, you kind of no longer had that right. Well, the problem, of course, is that that's exactly when pe people wanted to have powers of attorney, was to take care of this issue of what happens if they're incapacitated. And so the legislature passed a special law that said, um, as long as you include in the power of attorney special language which says that it is intended to survive your subsequent incapacity or that it's intended to be durable, then the power of attorney lasts. So that's a durable power of attorney. Next slide. 